Well, hey guys, good morning. Um, good morning, good morning. It is wonderful to be able to teach to some of uh, this church body in person this morning, and it is always a pleasure to be able to, uh, to teach to you all at home. Um, what a unique opportunity. As we start to do this transition, I don't want to get too much off topic because there's a lot to teach. I do want to make this one statement. Praise God for um, this pandemic because he uses all things for good. And one of the things that I have seen is I have seen husbands, I have seen fathers pick up the role of a spiritual leader in their household as they got their family to gather around a phone or electronic device like you might be doing right now and lead their family in worship and lead their family <laughs> in prayer. Um, so if you, <laughs> right as I said that. Um, but what an amazing opportunity that's been. And I just, uh, I can't express how, how proud I am for all, the, uh, all of the, the, the people that have taken their own family's spiritual health um, with such great importance during this time. And I'm grateful that, uh, that we can be here this morning. So with that said, if you have your Bibles or your apps, let's go ahead. We're going to jump right into our teaching this morning. Um, we're in the book of James, and we're going to be looking at chapter 5. And we're in, um, I believe we're in verse 7 through 12 this morning. So we're going to be in James chapter 5, uh, verse 7 through 12. If you have your Bibles or your apps, you can go along and follow along. Otherwise, we do have it up here on the screen. It says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop. Patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains. James says, you too be patient. Stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. He closed by saying, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. So that's our scripture this morning. Uh, we, have our online, we have our online camera going. We have our regular recording going too, right? Wonderful, terrific. Um, so it's really tempting right now and I guess, I shouldn't say right now, it's just always very tempting um, to look at the scripture or to look at specific texts um, very superficially and just kind of gloss over them and, and see maybe a topic that jumps out at you that's being addressed and then use said topic as a, as a springboard to talk about Christian living, all right? This is a very easy thing to do, um, and unfortunately, it's wildly popular in the American church. And our text that we're looking at this morning, James, is one of those that frequently gets abused in this manner. It is oftentimes used as a springboard text to talk about a topical sermon on patience. And what happens is this text gets read, and then the, the, the leader or the pastor um, or the life group leader, the Bible study leader, ends up talking and teaching and discussing um, about the need for patience in marriages, patience in relationships, patience in traffic jams, patience with your promotion, patience with your children. Um, that's great. There's nothing wrong with applying text to all areas of your life, but uh, when you actually sit down and look at the text that we're looking at this morning, and you look at it in its entire context, going all the way back to the beginning of uh, verse 1 of chapter 5, and all the way through, what you realize is James has been writing to believers about the wicked, wealthy people, right? Verse 1 through verse 6 is all about, church, man, there's some people that are just rotten. They're wealthy, rotten people literally robbing from you and oppressing you and they suck and it's terrible and it's not fair that's what the whole section is about okay and he's acknowledging these people's pain and suffering underneath their rich oppressors uh, oppressors that's the greater context of the passage 
It's the suffering of the poor in the church. It's the uh, suffering of the destitute believer in Christ. And James, as a good pastor, knows the pain that his people are in mentally and emotionally. He knows they're being treated unfairly and unjustly right now. And he also knows that in their hearts, his people are crying out, How long, right? How long must must we endure? And he might also have heard them vocalize their longing for justice. Um, Talk to him maybe about the relief from the oppression and what Christ is going to do. So what James does in this letter to the Jewish Christians is he responds to this cry for justice, for relief in the middle of terrible suffering in verse 7 through 12 by simply saying, guys, I get it, now be patient. That's the context. Be patient, guys. See, he knows their pain, he sees their suffering, and I think it's unique that James does not encourage the believers by saying, um, hey, it's going to be over soon, don't worry about it, your blessing is right around the corner. No, he goes, guys, uh, you're going to have to have patience, my friends. No, church, I, I believe it is much easier to teach a sermon and receive a sermon that is focused on developing patience so you can have a more happy life. I believe it's easier to teach a sermon and receive a sermon about patience when we're talking about how we can have patience so we can receive more blessings from God. I think it's very difficult to teach a sermon, receive a sermon that's encouraging you to have patience in the middle of unjust, unfair, unrighteous suffering. Like, ain't nobody want to hear that mess. Like, I don't, I don't want to be told to be patient in my suffering. But now if you tell me to be patient in my career because God's going to reward me and bless me abundantly and give me more money, I'll listen to that sermon. But that ain't what it is about. And we don't get to do that with the text. I hope that even though that's an easier one to receive and this is a harder pill to swallow, my hope is that you come here every Sunday or you tune in every Sunday to uh, the teachings at Forge because You don't want just pleasant messages that speak to your flesh, but you want to hear what the text actually says in its context. And you want to know how to apply the text to your life in a similar manner that the original audience would have applied that message to their life in their time in history. I hope that's why you're here. Because I don't know any other way to do it except for to exegete the scripture. Okay, So if that's good with you guys... That's what I want to do. So up and down, north and south, we can get rocking and rolling on this. Awesome. Good. So uh, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at verse 7 through 12 where James calls the Christians to have great patience in the midst of this unjust suffering at the hands of wicked people. And as we begin to unpack the text this morning, I'm going to show you how James lays out four particular steps for developing patience in the middle of horrific suffering that is unfair, unjust, and unrighteous, okay? Um, It's a how-to, but it's not a topical how-to that I'm just going to pull things out that I think are good out of self-help books. We're going to look at what James gives us, and he makes it very clear. Um, Now, the whole book of James, if you've noticed going through this series, or if you've just tuned in for the last few, you notice James is all about faith that works. Like, if you could summarize James in one catchphrase that would be very tweetable, it would be, faith works. Authentic faith, real faith works. Authentic faith has authentic works, right? However you want to say it. And James is constantly saying, if you want to know if you have real faith, here's a litmus test. Look at these things. Does your life not always show these because, let's be honest, we're sinners and and we, we stink sometimes, right? But does your life have elements of this more often than not? And here he's saying real faith, true faith, authentic faith works, and the works by which you're seeing the faith be real is the work of patience. So if you want to know, is your faith real? Well, do you have patience in suffering? If you're like, well, crap, no, I don't. Okay, well, then let's work on that, all right? Let's develop some sanctification in that area. But there should be some elements. If we've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit and we are in Christ, we should not handle suffering like we did before Christ came into our life. Amen? We may not be great at it. We're not the poster child, but there should be elements. And James is going to encourage us this morning to give us some pointers, all right? All right. So let's just jump right into the first one. Uh, My hope this morning, though, is that you're going to learn how to suffer well. 
My hope for you guys is that you, that you won't become people that don't suffer. Y'all going to suffer. If, if, you're, if you're older, your suffering will be over sooner. <laughs> if you're younger, like my 13-year-old daughter, I'm, I apologize, the world sucks. You're going to suffer for another probably 70 years unless God takes you sooner. Okay. I mean, this is just the reality of life. All right. So my, my hope is that you suffer well, guys. Suffer well, suffer well, suffer well. First step that James lays out is to remember what's coming. This is the first step to overcome suffering. Or I shouldn't say overcome suffering, but develop patience in the midst of suffering. And let's be honest, when we have patience and suffering, it kind of feels like we're overcoming it, doesn't it? Right? Just like that, right? So we look at, let's look at verse 7 and 8. We're going to see James lay this out. Verse 7 begins like this. He says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. And then, so he makes a statement, but now notice what he does. He starts telling a story. All right? He's going to paint a picture. He tells him what to do. Be patient until the Lord's coming. Now he's going to stop and he says this. He goes, see how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crops. He goes on to say, he patiently waits for the autumn and the spring rains. Now he stops the story and he goes back to talking to his people by saying, you too, right, compare them to the farmer, be patient, stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. So um, James is the little brother of Jesus, okay? James is the little brother of Jesus, and because of James's close contact with, with uh, Jesus, it's not surprising that there are times where you read the book of James and you find that he writes in ways that sound very similar to how Jesus spoke. If somebody's confused right now going, how did Jesus have a brother? Well, understand Mary didn't stay a virgin forever. She had a husband, and she did what husbands and wives do, and the result of that is sometimes you make a baby. So Jesus had half-brothers and sisters, okay? If you never taught your kids that, I just taught them the birds and the bees. You're welcome. Um, but Jesus had half-brothers. We don't know how many siblings he has. It's not important. But we do know that James was one of them. He was raised with Jesus. So when you read the book of James, it's, it shouldn't surprise you that sometimes you read and you go, man, that sounds a lot like Jesus. That sounds a lot like something he would say. And this is one of those. See, Jesus frequently um, uh, uh, talked in um, parables about um, agrarian life. He oftentimes spoke of things that were agriculturally um, significant. He spoke in stories. He compared things to what the people understood at the time. They were uh, an agrarian society. They, they raised cattle. They grew crops. And that's how he would relate to people. He spoke the language of the people. Um, James here takes a page out of his playbook, and he starts speaking very similar to that, right? Now, he says, be patient which is a solid point. He says, be patient, though, until the Lord's coming. And we can kind of get that. And then he closes in verse 7 by essentially saying, if you do this, uh, you'll be better at doing this if you can remember that his coming is near. Now, if he just said those two parts, the beginning of 7, be patient until the Lord's coming, remember the Lord's coming is near, we'd be like, okay, I'm like I get that. But if we're honest, man, that kind of falls flat for a lot of us, right? We're like, that's that could be powerful, but for a lot of us, we're not moved by that. It doesn't really hit home because we're very much removed um, from uh, oftentimes the awe and wonder that we should have in God. The awe and wonder at the second coming of Christ. The awe and wonder of anticipating that he's coming back. You know, after 2,000 years, um, some of us have grown restless. So what James does is he compares how we should be towards, uh, uh, with this analogy of the farmer. So he goes, listen, look around you. He says, everyone farms, you know, big scale or little scale, everyone grows stuff right now, he's telling them. And, and if you don't know, or if you don't grow something, you know someone who does. A lot different than today, right? Not, we don't all farm here. Um, I can't farm. I would never want to farm. That, that sounds very scary to me. Uh, but he says, see how these people have to wait. They have to wait for months and seasons, entire seasons, for their crops to grow. And they have to wait for a long period of time, um, sometimes in great frustration for these early rains of spring and these late rains of autumn. He goes, see how they have to wait for these things. They have to plant, they have to sow their seed, and then they just sit back and they're just staring at it. You know, I don't know if that's what you do as a farmer. You just, the rest of your day is just spent staring at crops, so I'd be terrible at it. But he goes, okay, you see how they're doing that? He goes, now go do the same thing, right? He goes, be like those guys. Have the ability to be patient 
knowing that abundance is coming, or in this case, deliverance. See, the farmer knows abundance is coming. He stares at the land that looks no different than it did before the seeds went in, but he has assurance because the farmer knows what's coming. He's waiting patiently for the ground to produce. He's saying, do the same thing. Be like them. Have that same type of steadfast resolve, knowing that not so much abundance, but deliverance for you is coming in the middle of suffering. Be like the farmer, you know. Um, but if you notice what he's saying here, I think this is important. James never says a farmer isn't discouraged in times of, of leanness, right? If you know farmers, oftentimes there's seasons that are difficult for them, right? They, they don't have the money coming in all year long. They have these particular times where they can harvest, but oftentimes in those winter months where the ground is frozen and it's harsh and unyielding and the bank account is low and the bills are high and the anxiety might build up in that person, he doesn't say they don't get like that. He doesn't say that they don't have feelings and they don't sometimes get stressed because they're human. He's, he's not saying that. He's saying be like them in the sense that in those moments where the season is harsh, the crops aren't growing quickly, they have steadfast resoluteness. They have patience because they know that come that season, like clockwork, every year there will be a harvest, and that harvest will be abundant, and that harvest will provide for the family. See, they quell their anxiety in the midst of suffering or hard seasons by knowing the ground will produce in time. Jim says, be like that. Why can't you be like that? In time, Christ will return. In time, things will get better. Right? Right? So just like there's barren ground and the farmer knows eventually it's going to produce wheat and grain, in the same sense, we should know that our life of suffering and our life of oppression will eventually turn into an eternal life of pleasure and freedom. And it will be a season unlike the farmer's season of, of harvest. Our season when Christ returns and ushers us into pleasure and abundance and freedom, it will be a season that has no end. It will be a season that brings perfect relief, perfect restoration, perfect justice, and it will be all ushered in by the return of Christ who welcomes his church and comes for his bride. And that's a darn good thing to think about. I think it's really important to notice that James never says, and I touched on this before, but I want to really hammer in on this, because this is the popular teaching that's out there in the garbage um, prosperity gospel churches of America. But James never says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it in, in a good, uh, in a good um, accent here. Church, your, your season of blessing is just right around the corner. Just hang in there and trust in Jesus. He's going to deliver you and just claim your blessings in the name of Jesus. Speak your blessings into existence because it's coming. Dude, come on. Like that's a, sounds great, but it's garbage. James don't say that. He does not say that. You know, or God's about to bless you in front of your enemy's faces. Right? You, I've heard that one before, unfortunately. He's just going to show them that you're a child of God. Maybe the way he's going to show them that you're a child of God and bless you is by helping you develop patience and suffering and let you suffer even worse and they see the light of Christ in you as you cling to hope and have patience through it. But y'all don't want that, right? But see, this, this, this isn't what... The word promises. If you want to know what the word promises, let me let me let me show you. Oops, I don't have it up on the screen. But it's a, uh, it's in John's Gospel, chapter sixteen, verse thirty-three. And here's what Jesus says when it comes to suffering. All right, and this is why James doesn't make these dumb statements that the prosperity gospel makes. Jesus says this: In this world, you will have suffering or trouble, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. And James agrees, right? It, like, yeah, the world sucks, but praise God that this world is not the end, and heaven as we know it is also not permanent. Amen? You're like, what? Wait a minute. Heaven isn't permanent? No. Not heaven as we know it. Right? right? See, Scripture tells us that Jesus is going to come back to earth in his resurrected, physical, and glorified body. That's what James is saying. Look forward to, right? Remember what's coming. But that's not the, the end-all, be-all, okay? 
See, the first time that Jesus came was to establish his spiritual kingdom and serve, suffer, and die. The next time Jesus comes, it's going to be to establish his physical kingdom and conquer, rule, and reign. See, the second coming that James is calling them to remember is going to usher in the full kingdom of God that we can only see partially right now. But soon we're going to see in full. Revelation 21.1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. See, there is going to be a full restoration back to the garden where everything will be made new and we will not live as these spiritual disembodied beings in heaven worshiping at the throne of Christ, but we will have the physical throne of God on earth in glorified resurrected bodies where there is no pain, no suffering, no sin, no gossip, no hardships, no cancer, amen? Amen. Yeah, okay. We're grateful that we get to see Reba here as she's enduring great suffering uh, through cancer and um, what a testament to what God can do as he gives us patience, right? See, if you're in Christ this morning, if you're someone who's repented and believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want you to understand that your immediate suffering finds its perspective in your eternal reality. Let me say that again if you missed that. Um, If you are in Christ this morning, then I want you to understand that your immediate suffering, okay, finds its perspective in your eternal reality. What's your eternal reality? Glorified body, living in a perfect restored earth, in the presence of God. Okay? There's your perspective, all right? So our focus should not be on waiting for the situations around us to get better, but rather our focus is on waiting for Jesus to come back and make things better because we might never see our circumstances here on earth change. That's the reality, and that's a tough reality to swallow, man. But people might be miserable to you until the day you die or until the day that they die, okay? Um, You might face opposition and persecution and injustice every day of your life with absolutely no relief, but I want you to remember this, my friends. If your perspective shifts from earthly to eternally, you're going to find peace knowing that justice is always going to come, all right? If you're not finding justice now, just wait, because eventually there will be perfect justice. See, every single human on earth will have to pay the penalty for their sins. Everyone will. Either they will pay by suffering eternal persecution, eternal suffering in hell apart from God. That is how they will pay the penalty for their sin. That will be justice. Or the justice will come as the individual goes to Christ and has his righteousness imputed to them and passes on their sin to Christ and his suffering is enough. Either we turn to Christ and the justice that was poured out on him, the wrath of God that was poured out on him, we get to take part in that, or the justice comes as the person rejects Christ and they have to suffer. Either way, there's justice that's going to be done. So if you're not getting justice now, hang in there. Justice is coming one way or another. Remember what's coming, all right? So after James calls them to remember, he then presents to them the second step, which is to keep yourselves from grumbling, all right? Now, this is laid out in verse 9. He says, don't grumble against one another, brothers or sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Now, I don't believe that anyone, I could be wrong, but I truly don't believe that anybody enjoys grumbling. I know people that do it a lot, um, but I struggle to believe that they find pure, unadulterated passion and enjoyment in grumbling. I don't know anybody that gets really excited like, I had the greatest day. I whined and moaned and grumbled all day, and it was glorious. Like, I don't think anybody really loves doing it. Um, I would also say, I don't, I don't believe anybody likes to be around people that grumble. I don't know if you can think in your life, oh, this might be asking you guys to sin, but think of someone that you know that grumbles a lot, right? Do you like being around that person? Do you enjoy your time with them? I would, I would highly think that you don't. Um, and personally, I hate grumbling. I want to be very careful I, I, that I don't say I hate people that grumble because I don't hate the person, but man, I hate grumbling. To me, it's one of those things, I think it's my pet peeve. It's like fingernails on a chalkboard, um, especially when I hear someone grumble about any form of hard work. That's the part that really bothers me. Like Whether it's like their job, um, whether it's like stuff to do around the house, or whether it's in the gym working out, when someone grumbles about having to do that stuff, like I, I really, 
struggle to love them as I'm supposed to. And oftentimes it causes me to have to repent because I don't always think the greatest thoughts about it. Um, so that's my sin nature. Um, I blame my sin nature, but I would also blame 12 years of active duty military that taught me that if you get sick, that is mental weakness in your own head. And if you complain, then you get publicly shamed. So I, I do blame my sin nature, but also the military. Needless to say, um, grumbling is not an attractive quality to have. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on a dating website, but I have never seen a profile that says, like, likes cats, action movies, and grumbling. Like, it's just, it's not a desirable quality. Nobody really looks for that. Um, my, two ki my two middle kids, I don't know if they're here this morning, Bella and Ezekiel, I don't keep track of all of them. I have, I have enough of them that if I lose one, I, they, I can still have um, a solid uh, sports team. Um, but my two middle kids, Bella and Ezekiel, I remember uh, not too long ago, they found a couple of magnets in the yard. And they were so blown away by how cool it was when they tried to take the magnets, like when the two um, sides, uh, the two you know, positive sides or negative sides were pointing towards each other. They thought it was so cool that they, no matter how hard they pushed, they could not get them to connect. I mean, they were fascinated by this. And you know, I told them it was magic because, you know, why not? Um, and, and then I said, I can change, and I flipped around my hand. I was like, see, Dad's magic. You know, terrible parent, but don't judge me. Make your own babies. Ruin their lives. I'll do my own. Um, but they also thought it was so cool when they put the magnets on the table, and they would kind of start moving one towards the other, and then it would scoot away, right? It's kind of like the magnet chases the other. No matter how fast they go, it just can't catch it. It just it, um, it repels the other one. And grumbling and patience is kind of like that. See, one will always push the other away, Okay. Patience will push away grumbling. Grumbling will push away patience. Um, no matter how hard you try, these two things cannot coexist in you at the same time. But the problem is we don't see the danger in grumbling because uh, we just don't call it what it is, right? We don't call grumbling what it is, and that's why we don't see it dangerous. We call it venting, don't we? I think oftentimes we call grumbling venting. And, and we do that because that's how we justify our bad behavior. See, venting, it, it, true venting is completely different from grumbling. Um, but venting still is just as dangerous. See, venting, I would say, is a very slippery slope, and it's typically not done well by people. Um, and I'm not good at it either because, like I said, it's a, it's a very dangerous um, thing to play with. Now, if you are simply coming home at the end of the day and just unloading all the facts about your day or all the facts about a situation without allowing it to be filled with um, negative talk about another person or filled with sinful anger rising up in you, like, cool, you know, I call that a good debriefing. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. Um, if we're just sitting down with a friend or a spouse and we're just telling them about the emotions we're feeling and simply just putting the emotions out there so someone can hear us and know what we're going through, I mean, that's, that's terrific, but let's be real. We don't see that type of venting very often, do we? See, typically, venting is a way that we justify dwelling on our anger about the day and slandering someone else. Um, it's usually a long, emotion-filled rant with our voice going louder and louder and other people's names being brought in. It places us as the victim sometimes, and it gives us this chance in our safe space, right, to unload about how wrong and how stupid and how hurtful everyone else was to us that day. And it allows us to put all of our anger at them, and we feel justified in doing it because we're like, well, we're just venting. We're not doing it to them. We're just doing it behind their back, right? Like, come on, man. Um, this isn't venting. This is grumbling. And yeah, what happened to you that day, it might have sucked, but grumbling about what happened is not the solution, guys. And I'm speaking this to myself, too, okay? Um, but when I say that, I think the knee jerk that a lot of people would say is, oh, yeah, yeah, but, but I need to let my feelings out. I need to let my feelings out. I need to give voice to my emotions. Says who? Who says you're supposed to? See, we're told by pop psychology that if we feel it, it must be true, right? That's the new thing nowadays. If you feel it, it must be true. If it's true to you, then it should be true to others, right? Feelings and emotions are never wrong to have. You should embrace your feelings and, like, that's just dumb. Like, that's 
That is wildly unbiblical. We believe it because we're told it. We're taught it in school. It's reinforced in our culture, but that ain't biblical. Let let me give you a biblical perspective on on every feeling or emotion that comes up in your heart. Are you ready for it? 1 Corinthians 10.5 says this. We take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. Not we give voice to every single one. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Proverbs 29, 11, A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise person holds it in check. Let me make this very clear, okay? Just because you feel it doesn't mean it's okay. Just because no one else heard you ranting in your car or in your bedroom doesn't mean that you're sinless, blameless, all right? Uh, grumbling, complaining, whatever you want to call it, It's not only a patience killer, my friends, but it's also sinful. And if it's done in the presence of another person, well, now it's gossip. So you got that to add to it. This is dangerous. Patience and grumbling, it's the magnets, my friends. You can't push them together, and one pushes the other way every time. All right? Grumbling, my friends, it focuses on the problem. It focuses on the people, and grumbling focuses on frustration. And here's the thing. No amount of grumbling will ever quell the frustration or bed the problem. Rather, grumbling always magnifies the issue and drags others into it. Are you with me on that? Grumbling always will magnify your problem, and it will drag others into it. Okay? Um, Patience is difficult on its own. I get that. Patience while suffering is hard, but patience while suffering unfairly is impossible without the power of the Holy Spirit moving you. It's just not. You can't do it yourself, okay? Um, this can only be accomplished by God's grace through, through his Holy Spirit. And here's a problem. When we step away from the influence of the Spirit in our lives, who is a quiet whisper, and we give in to the loud yells of the flesh, and we begin to grumble, you're going to find yourself unable to endure your trials patiently. What's going to happen is you're going to start desiring things like revenge, your anger, to be heard, to be right. You're going to want others to suffer. You're going to want to be around other people that are miserable or have others be miserable with you so you don't feel alone. You're going to believe that you should be pitied. You're going to take on the role of the victim. And you're going to rob God of his glory to do something amazing through your suffering. And that's wasting your suffering. Don't waste your suffering. We're supposed to be like Paul. Paul says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in skies. You're like, well, sure, Paul can say it. He probably had a great life. No, no, his life sucked. Externally. Do you know when Paul wrote that? He said, don't grumble. He was writing to a church in the city of Philippi. And the reason why he was writing to them is because this church knew Paul was in jail. He was stuck in Roman jail. He was getting his butt kicked in a Roman jail unfairly, mentally, emotionally. Maybe not physically, maybe he was. But he's towards the end of his life. He's an old man. Like, I feel bad for old dudes when I have to see them get up out of a recliner. I'm like, I can just do that for you. Well, Paul's like at that age, and he's in a Roman house arrest. He's cut off from the world around him. He's suffering. We know physically, probably mentally, emotionally. You know, he's living COVID every day of his his golden years. And the church is like, let's send someone to help Paul out. Paul's like, I don't need you. I'm good. And he doesn't grumble about it. He actually tells them, hey, guys, don't grumble. And if you're like, well, did Paul really live that up? Yeah, man, read any of his letters. Read any letter from Paul. He wrote a lot of them. The majority of the New Testament is writings from Paul. You will not find one iota in Paul's letters that have him grumbling about his situation. Homeboy was, he he got beat so bad one time he was naked. You ever been beat so bad you you lost your clothes because someone beat you up that bad? Like I've been hit so hard I lost a shoe, but I've never been beaten naked. Paul's been stripped and beaten naked. He's been shipwrecked, abandoned, um, cold, hungry, homeless. And he's like, not going to grumble. We're to be like that, my friends. That's how you have patience. Let's look at our third step, all right? Um, Verse 10 and 11. That's our third step. And James writes, Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. If you have your Bibles or apps, I want you to circle the word persevered because 
Up until this point, he used the word patience. But now he has a different Greek word that is better translated as perseverance. Um, your Bible might have it translated as um, patience, but a better translation of the Greek there is persevered. It's a different form of patience, and we'll get to that in a second. But he goes on to say, you've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So here, James has given us another call to remember as our third step. And this is a call to remember those who have endured. All right, so our third step that James gives us to be able to be people who are patient in suffering is to remember those who have endured, okay? Specifically, he's not talking about like, I got a friend, Charles, whose parents went through a divorce last summer, and uh, he was excited to have two Christmases, but he only got one, so like he really endured, like no, no, no. Say, remember the prophets of old, right? You're not supposed to remember just a random person. Open the Bible and look at the prophets, okay? Sp particularly these Old Testament prophets, right? Um, last week, we had a guest speaker at Forge. Uh, we were still doing online services. A good friend of mine, Kurt, was able to bring a faithful message, and I'm so grateful for that. And I, I just want to thank Kurt publicly for preaching the gospel so faithfully and respecting the pulpit and God's word. Um, but Kurt spoke for me um, because I was in the hospital. Uh, for those who know, I've never hid the fact that I struggle with um, mental illness. I struggle with anxiety. I struggle with depression. Um, I take, uh, um, I used to take lorazepam and citalopram, and now that I'm back from the hospital, I take a massive amount of more. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I use my medication, and I am um, grateful that God has blessed uh, doctors with the knowledge of modern medicine. I'm grateful for those who have insight into how the human mind works and levels, um, uh, chemical levels in the brain and how those work. Uh, but the other week, um, I had an all-time low. Um, I've always struggled, and this is just my personal sins I'm going to lay bare for you guys. Um, I've always struggled with the opinions of other people. Um, people have the power to either build me up or tear me down with a word. Um, the illogical part of that is I can have 100 people in one day tell me how much they love me, um, how much they appreciate me, um, Tell me how much they support me, but even if one person later that day attacks me, it crushes me. Just fully, it just wrecks me. And I'm fully aware that this is a sin issue. This is sinful, okay? Um, but by the grace of God, he's working on me, and I'm working on it myself to get past this. Uh, but the other week, um, someone who doesn't care for me took to social media, and this is one of the reasons why we've taken down our, our different social media presences. For right now, it's just healthy to have a break from it. Um, but uh, an individual who doesn't care for me too much uh, began to write at length um, paragraphs upon paragraphs about me. And as much as I knew that I shouldn't read the comments, you know, I, I, I'm not the only pastor in the world that gets people that slander some, right? And I know I shouldn't read it. Um, I knew I shouldn't read it because the individual had done it before, and I'm sure it was going to be just as bad. And, uh, but needless to say, because of um, uh, how I'm wired, I, I, I wanted to, and I started reading it. And... Um, I had to stop reading that for a couple paragraphs because the words that were written in, in these comments and reviews and whatnot were just so cruel and so hurtful and, and, and so grossly um, full of lies. Uh, it made me feel like I had this hot knife being plunged into my stomach and being twisted. It just this, like all the blood rushed out of my body and my, I just had this pain in my stomach. Um, and it, 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 it brought me to my knees. I laid on my kitchen floor and I just... I. I didn't sob, guys. I wailed. Um, my wife sat there holding me. Um, my kids came down. My, my beautiful 13-year-old daughter, Kaylee, came over. Um, they've seen me go through this before. My, my eight-year-old daughter, Bella, came to me, and um, I, I cried for, for a few hours. Um, uh, it, it, was, it was rough. Um, I, felt, um, I felt utterly alone in that moment. Friends, um, I felt naked. I felt exposed. Um, I felt like no one could understand me, and it was it was absolutely horrible. It was um, one of the worst moments that I have had. My wife, uh, very, being very concerned for me, there's a very high suicide rate of pastors these days. There was a very famous pastor that just recently uh, took his life, um, and no one would have known it. Um, 
uh, unfortunately, the, the uh, young pastors have a very high rate of suicide. Um, and my wife was concerned for my mental well-being, and uh, she should be. Um, I really appreciate that she did. And we took steps to immediately get me to the veterans hospital, and um, I was admitted to the mental health inpatient wing. And I'm going to say, just as it's hard for me to talk about this here, because it's a little bit embarrassing to stand up front and talk about your hurts, I was embarrassed walking into the hospital that day because, you know, here I am, I'm a pastor. And I know they're going to ask me eventually, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. Here I am just wrecked. Why? Because someone was mean to me. <laughs> but, man, it was, it was hard to do that. Uh, but, my friends, I cannot express to you how wonderful it was for me to be there. Um, God did a work in me there. He didn't do a, a complete full work. <laughs> I'm still struggling with this stuff. But he did some massive healing in my life while I was there. And one of the things he showed me while I was there was that I wasn't alone. Okay. Um, it's such a simple concept that we're like, yeah, of course. But see, here's the deal. When you're in the crosshairs of someone else unfairly, um, when you're suffering unjustly, what happens is we naturally feel very isolated. We feel very alone in what we're going through. But while I was there, I had other veterans around me who were going through very similar things. Um, and that was beyond encouraging to me, to sit down in my pajamas and slippers, because that's what you wore every day, so it was kind of just like quarantine, as we all shuffled to the room <laughs> with our rubber coffee mugs. I'm going to have to start drinking out of it, but I, you get a rubber coffee mug so you can't hurt yourself with it. So you shuffle there with your rubber coffee mug. You feel like Jack Nicholson and one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And you sit down in your robe. But then you're just around. I can make fun of it because that's me. I'm part of it. So you don't get to, but I can. Um, but I was like, my eyes were open. I'm like, I'm not alone in this. There's other people that are struggling with these same things. And it was the most welcome thing I've ever experienced. And then I went back to my room because I was there for a full week. And, I, and I, all I had with me was my Bible. They took away everything else. And I had my Bible. And I'm like, you know what? I, I'm going to go ahead and look at what our text is for the next week. Then I read this. And I was like, are you, are you, are you serious? <laughs> I'm like, this is just what God is showing me, and now it's confirmed in the text where James is saying, listen, if you want to be patient while you're suffering, remember other people that suffered. I'm like, I get it. <laughs> like, I get it. I'm remembering other vets who are suffering because they're crazy, but now I'm remembering that there's prophets who suffer because they're godly. I'm like, I'm a little bit of both. This works. By crazy, my godly find a benefit here. You get what I'm saying, right? But here's the deal, man. The, the prophets of old, friends, their suffering was way more miserable than any of ours was. Let me, let me give you a little background on the life of a prophet, okay? They were individuals who were called by God to be God's voice to God's people. Are you tracking up and down? You get that? That's their job. We don't have a need for prophets nowadays, okay? Um, because we have, we have this. We have the word, all right? We have the inspired word in front of us. The eternal word that was self-existent before creation, who became flesh and was called Jesus, all of his words are recorded in the word. So if you want to know what God has to say, you don't have to look for a prophet anymore. You have to open your Bible. Dur, dur, dur. I'm just waiting to hear from God. Read your Bible! Okay, I'm not fully healed from the mental place. <laughs> But, but you know what I mean? So, but prior to the, the full revelation of God's word completed in the scriptures, they had prophets. And these prophets um, would go around and they'd give God's word to God's people. Um, but this, this call to be a prophet, this role, um, this task, it was oftentimes a death sentence for these cats. And if it didn't end in death, it usually uh, endured a life of misery and persecution. Like, it wasn't like, hey, God called me to prophet. This is going to be awesome. It's like, you sure you, ah, oh, it's just me. It was, it's rough, man. It was rough. And here's why. See, they spoke about things that were to come, and the things that were to come typically were God's judgment on people. That's not a popular message, is it? Like, if you're the guy, every time someone sees you, you're like, hey, God's wrath is coming on you. They're going to be like, oh, not him again, Right? Their messages were not popular. They weren't well-received. And it's not surprising that people didn't receive prophets well. Prophets were mocked. They were slandered. They were abused. Their message was 
oftentimes not received. Their message was oftentimes met with um, speculation, um, met with um, criticalness, cynicism, or all-out rejection. And that would not be that bad if you knew as soon as you said it, in about 24 hours, God would be like, all right, I got this. Wrath! Right? You'd be like, ha-ha, proved right. But typically, these guys would have to wait sometimes months, years, decades, or lifetimes before the prophecy they spoke would be fulfilled. And what would happen in the meantime? You're the guy that spoke something that never came true. Can you imagine how that had to be? They're being called liars, hypocrites, frauds. You're not a prophet. Didn't happen. You're a liar. You know it's from God. Didn't happen. It's going to. You die. Now your kids are known as the child of the liar. They may have to wait generations before God does what they said. You talk about a life of unjust suffering? The prophets got that. And here I am like, what was me? Perspective. In the prophets, James tells you, remember them. Why? Because in them you have a friend, you have a companion in suffering, right? And you have someone who didn't just do it poorly, but someone who did it well. My friends, I read Isaiah frequently while I was in that hospital room for that week. I'm like, dude, I need to hear about this guy's life. Jeremiah, the, the weeping prophet, lamentations, Ezekiel. I'm like, give me, give me water from your words because I need to know that someone else has suffered and did it well. Remember those who endured, my friends. I'm going to skip a lot because we're out of time. I had a really great like sly or, or quote from a Rocky movie because I like Rocky and I was going to tell you this really cool story and it was going to be fun. And I was going to use my Rocky Balboa accent that I've been working on for 20 years. Hey, yo, you know, But I don't have time to do it. So you're just going to miss that. But it was really good and I can't do it because our time is pretty much up and I'm just going to close with our last step. And you're like, well, how are you going to do that? It's going to take 15 minutes. No. Here's why. The three steps that James gives for developing patience that we've already covered, remembering what's coming, keeping yourselves from grumbling, and remembering those who have endured. Um, these all have, there's a lot of meat to them, okay? There's a lot to pull out of it, but this last one, it's kind of like an addendum, it's like an add-on, and it's so simplistic. I mean, it's gonna sound complicated, but honestly, this is like the easiest thing to grasp, and, and uh, we can miss it if we're not careful, and oftentimes, verse 12 is not preached with the greater context, but let me read it to you. Here's our last step. Don't bargain with God. And we find this in verse 12. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. So this can sound confusing, but seriously, this is such a simple point. I'm going to do this whole thing in about two sentences. All right? um, a lot of people, when they find themselves in a bad situation um, and they're suffering, what's the first thing that a lot of people do? Think about it. What's the first thing a lot of people do when they're suffering? Maybe you've done it before, too, and you're just embarrassed to say it. Get down on your knees. Okay, God, if you can get me out of this, I promise I will. Don't act like you haven't done that, dude. I have done that. Okay, God, if you make this stop, I promise that I will never again. This is bargaining with God. In this case, it's swearing. So swearing an oath is what James is referring to. He's saying, don't do this. You don't need to swear an oath with God. Don't do that. Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't make bargains with God. Not only is it disrespectful, it's irreverent. And it's you trying to manipulate God. When you put it that way, just understand if you want to do that, okay, just so you know, you're trying to manipulate God. Just let me know how that works out for you. Love to hear about it. God is going to be like, oh, right, I believe you. Make it go away. Like, no, no, endure. Do not bargain with God. Don't go to that point. And here's the deal, man. In the long run, trying to do this bargaining with God or even with other people when you're suffering, it doesn't increase patience endurance, uh, patient endurance, does it? It usually just increases anxiety because you're like, am I going to be able to stick to my promise I made? Are they actually going to follow through? What's going to happen? Like, nah. this isn't a helpful thing to do. It's a natural reaction because we just want it done. James says, don't do it. I, I, he's probably been down that road. I tried bargaining with my half-brother Jesus. It doesn't work. You know? 
We don't need to make some crazy oath to get out of a jam. What we need to do is we need to submit, remember, keep ourselves from grumbling, and look to those who have endured. Um, I said this morning when we began that my hope is that you become people who suffer well. I said I want you to become people who look for justice when you're under oppression, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can endure far longer than maybe those around you who have no hope in Christ, right? Um, church, let me close with this thought. Contrary to what people say, God will always give you more than you can handle. I'll say that again. God will always give you more than you can handle. I know that's contrary to what people post on little Instagram quotes. God will never give you more than you can handle. That's, that's stupid and a lie. No, he always will give you more than you can handle. That's why you need him. That's why you need the power of Christ. That's why you need the cross. That's why you need to cling to him like an anchor in a storm. And I'm sorry that God does not simply only give us what we can handle in our own flesh because it's hard. It's hard being faithful, isn't it? It's tough. And people can be cruel and mean and petty and life can be difficult. And diagnosis can sometimes be very difficult to hear. I'm sorry about this, but my friends, when you will suffer, it's not a matter of if, when you suffer, it's hard. I look at my little children. My 8-year-old has not suffered yet. My 13-year-old has. My wife has. I have. There are going to come a time in your life where you will suffer horrifically. When you suffer, my friends, your faith will be shown as authentic to those around you if you can endure it with patience like so many faithful saints have done before. And that is my prayer for us this morning. Let me close this. Father, thank you for a chance to be able to learn from your word. Lord, thank you for um, Father, thank you for the support of my family during a difficult time. Thank you for teaching me how to endure suffering. Father, forgive me for the times that I have not suffered well. Father, I, I pray that I would never be too afraid to share my sins and my suffering with people around me. Um, if anything, Lord, let me be an example of, uh, of, of what happens when people stray from you. Let me also be an example of what it looks like to be faithful to you. Father, I ask that Forge Church would be a transparent community that can share what they're going through with no fear of judgment, that we can rely on others to pick us up and bear each other's burdens. Let us be a real church. Uh, Lord, thank you for what we learned this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you don't give us a life without suffering, but that you refine us and grow us into a greater dependence upon you when we do suffer. Father, I thank you for the times that you have allowed me to suffer. I thank for the times that I have cried to you with sobs and heaving chest, asking you to deliver me, but you refused to take your hand off my life. You refused to release the suffering. Um, Lord, I thank you for the times that you have pushed me down and made me feel crushed because in those I have found a greater relationship and dependence upon you that I would never have if I didn't suffer. So Lord, thank you for suffering. Lord, help us to be people, though, that can learn from it, can be... Um, grown through it and help us to have grace on those who are going through it around us. Uh, Lord, we eagerly await to be able to see health restored and uh, more gathered. Uh, in the meantime, Father, let us be graceful with one another, not casting judgments on those who have chosen to do one or the other. May we be united in truth, holding firm to the gospel of Jesus, assured of our salvation, and loving one another as brothers and sisters. We ask these things in Christ's name.